As mentioned in some past presentations, the state of prisons, or gaols as they were also known, in the 17th and 18th century were truly disgusting. Overcrowded, underfunded, freezing in winters, sweltering hot in summer, disease and illness were more than at home there. Conditions were more akin to something out of the medieval era than a growing industrial nation like Britain. The guards were brutal and often corrupt. They were set up to punish only. There was no thought of anything in the way of reform or rehabilitation. And of course, on top of this, all prisoners lived under the shadow of what was known as the Bloody Code, a list of over 300 crimes, some as minor as stealing bread, that all carried the death penalty. But there were those who set out to change things. Among them was the woman we are covering today, Elizabeth Fry. Although most famously known by her married name, Elizabeth Fry, she was born Elizabeth Gurney on the 12th of May, 1780, in Gurney Court, just off Magdalen Street, in the city of Norwich, Norfolk. She was one of 13 children, sadly only six of whom would survive, born to John Gurney, a prominent and influential Quaker, a partner in the Gurney Bank and a wool-spinning factory owner, and his wife Catherine, herself the daughter of Catherine Barclay, from the family that began Barclay's Bank. And over a hundred years after Elizabeth's birth, Gurney Bank would be merged with Barclay's. As you can imagine, with both sides of the family engaged in the banking business, the Gurneys were extremely wealthy and she grew up in Earlham Hall on the outskirts of the city. It is now part of the University of East Anglia. The wealth of the family would be commented on much later, after Elizabeth's death, in the Gilbert and Sullivan comic opera Trial by Jury, with a character wishing to gather wealth until he became as rich as the Gurneys. This level of wealth and privilege allowed her access to a level of education virtually unheard of for most women at this time, something that she very quickly became keen should become a universal for all, and she would pass on knowledge to all she could. But all the wealth in the world could not keep her family away from the harshness of life at the time. As well as the lost brothers and sisters, she was only 12 when her mother died in childbirth. And as one of the eldest, responsibility fell to her to raise her siblings. Among them were two that we will cover in future. Joseph John Gurney, who would go on to be an evangelical minister and whose opinions caused a split in the Quaker church in America, and Louisa Gurney, who was remembered as a diarist and a writer on education. As she grew, Elizabeth turned her attention to two main areas, her religion of Quakerism, with its strong ideals of equality and peace, and through the preaching of people like Deborah Darby and William Savory, she became increasingly aware of the wrongs of the world. And despite the extra family burden placed on her at such a young age, this didn't stop Elizabeth from starting her charitable work early. And by the age of 17, she had already set up a small Sunday school in her own home, where she educated the poor children from the surrounding area, as well as taking time to look after sick and lonely neighbours. Her day would also consist of two hours' silent worship. Elizabeth was married on the 19th of August, 1800, aged 20, to Joseph Fry, a fellow Quaker in the Quaker Meeting House on Goat Lane in Norwich. They had met in the July of 1799. For those who connect the name Fry with chocolate and were wondering, yes, this is the same Fry family. The chocolate making business was founded by an uncle, also named Joseph, in 1761. After their marriage, the couple moved to St Mildred's Court in London, where they lived above Joseph's family business, a tea shop, until 1809, when after his father's death, they moved to Plasheet House in East Ham. By 1811, Elizabeth was now recorded as a minister in the Religious Society of Friends, while Joseph had gone into the banking business himself, a line of work he was not totally cut out for. 1812 brought a financial panic to the city of London, and had it not been for Elizabeth involving herself in Joseph's business and calling in her family members with their experience in banking, it is incredibly likely that his entire business would have failed. They also took over as receivers of his family tea business, placing him on a salary of £600 a year while they de facto owned it. Away from their jobs and charities, Elizabeth and Joseph would come to have a sizeable family, eventually having 11 children. The work that would come to define Elizabeth's life began in 1813. After prompting and invitations from a friend, the French-American missionary Stephen Grillet, she went with him to visit Newgate Prison. What she encountered there shocked and horrified her, especially the 300 women in the prison. It was overcrowded, mixed, holding men, women, and often their children, all in the same location. Many of the women being held there had yet to even stand trial for their crimes. There was little food and water to go round, they were forced to cook and wash in their cells and had to sleep on the floor. There was no toilets other than a bucket in the corner of the room that was emptied very irregularly. 
she would describe the conditions as hell above ground. The next day, she returned with food and clothing to distribute to the imprisoned women, invaluable items to them. As with the prison system at the time, everything had to be bought directly from the prison warden. So those from poor families who could not afford food or new clothing didn't particularly receive food or new clothing. But due to the ongoing financial problems between her family and her husband, the details of the bank takeover had not fully settled yet. There was little more she was able to do at this point, although she would visit most days when she could, where she would read the Bible and hand out Bibles to women who wished to turn their lives around. By the time the dust had fully settled, it was 1816, and she returned to fund a school within the prison for the children who were locked up with their mothers. Next, she turned her attention to the prison itself. She demanded it should be segregated by sex. Prisoners should be classified and separated based on their crimes to keep the worst inmates away from lesser offenders. And rather than male guards, who were known to prey upon the more vulnerable female inmates, they should be looked after by female matrons. Of course, some of the women imprisoned in Newgate were there for more serious crimes, or had crimes that fell under the bloody code that carried the death penalty. Elizabeth took upon herself the grim task of walking with these condemned women to the gallows, comforting them the best she could, including several she had become friends with during her time there. The following year, she founded the Association for the Reformation of Female Prisoners, along with 12 other women, who would lobby both local authorities and Parliament about the problem with prisons. Among the things they wanted brought in was an idea that, although is common in prisons all over the world today, was virtually unheard of at the time. Instead of allowing prisoners to sit there all day doing nothing of value, they were to be taught practical skills that would prepare them for release and hopefully lead them away from crime when they were free. Of course, the employment opportunities for women at the time were slim to say the least, and the kind of skills they were taught reflected this. Sewing patchwork, knitting, and general needlepoint filled their days. Not only was this seen as a practical skill that could lead to employment, it was also something that was considered to be calming. As well as her day visits, Elizabeth would also stay overnight in the prison, so she could get more of a feel for what the inmates were going through. Often inviting members of the local nobility to come and spend the night with her, but she was hardly ever taken up on her kind offer. Her actions would lead to her becoming liked and respected by prisoners of both sexes across the country. Her work would be able to take a huge step forward in 1818, when her brother-in-law, Thomas Fowler Buxton was elected the MP for Weymouth and began to promote what she was doing among his fellow MPs. With his help, she was able to give evidence that same year in Parliament, the first woman in history to give evidence of any kind to Parliament. Speaking on the condition of British prisons, rallying against the conditions of how hardened criminals were placed with those who had committed minor offences, or in some cases even their first ever crime, how what she described the lowest of women were interacting with respectable married women and maid servants. Her actions and innovations would gain support and steam across the country, leading to the creation of the British Lady Society for promoting the reform of female prisoners in 1821. Fry's work would not be exclusive to prisons in London. She would travel all over the British Isles, from Scotland to Ireland, writing several diaries on her experiences constantly pushing forward her belief in prison reform and the ending of capital punishment, something she described as evil that would only lead to more evil. She was so successful that by 1823, many of her ideas had become part of British prison law, including the lifting of the death penalty from 130 crimes, and that guards would now be paid by the warden rather than by the prisoners. Nor was she only concerned with those who were to remain incarcerated in the shores of Britain when she turned her attention to those sentenced to transportation. We have covered transportation in an earlier video. In fact, the first transportation to Australia that featured a local couple, one from Norfolk, one from Suffolk, Henry and Susanna Cable, as they came to be known. Please follow the link on screen to watch this presentation. She was aghast with how she saw the practice carried out in Newgate Prison, especially towards female prisoners. The women were chained together and placed in an open horse-drawn cart and driven through the streets of the city where they were often pelted with rotten fruit and other filth by the locals. This outcome was so common that areas of the prison often devolved into riots led by the transportees the night before they were meant to go. Elizabeth spoke to the prison governor and persuaded him to use covered carriages to allow the prisoners some privacy during a time of such great distress. She also set her sights of improving the journey itself for prisoners. In total, 
she visited 106 prison ships and talked to around 12,000 convicts. She might not be able to change the conditions fully on board the ship, or how long the journey it would take, but she could push for the transportees to have something to do, rather than sit around and brood on their situation. She put forward plans where they would no longer be chained to the decks, allowing them to move around and interact a little more freely. She arranged for them to be given scraps of material and sewing kits so they could spend their time creating blankets and quilts to sell to the growing communities of convicts already in Australia. They were also each given a package containing food and water for the journey to supplement the meagre ship's ration, knives, forks and a Bible. The attention Fry would bring to transportation and its conditions would help bring about its abolition officially in 1837 and totally by 1843. During her time working in the prison system, she had become known as the Angel of the Prisoners. Away from the world of crime and punishment, Elizabeth would turn her attention to the needs of the homeless after seeing the body of a young boy who had frozen to death on the streets of London during the winter of 1819. She would establish night shelters to allow the homeless to spend cold winter nights indoors with some comforts, as well as opening soup kitchens. After a holiday to Brighton and being shocked by the number of poor and beggars on the streets, she instituted the Brighton District Visiting Society, a group of volunteers who went around the poorer homes in the city and offered help to those most in need. Like many of the others, her plans were soon copied countrywide. She pushed for greater education for the poor, especially for women. She also joined the campaign along with many Quakers, who had been proponents of it since the very beginning, to end the slave trade. She would even take her crusade of prison reform to other countries. While on a trip to France on other business, she took a detour to see the condition French prisoners had to live in, as well as over her life visiting prisons in the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany, with her ideas travelling as far away as Russia. Her good name would be affected by an incident out of her control in 1828. Her husband's business finally went bankrupt, something that was not allowed to happen within the Quaker society. And, to make matters worse, rumours soon spread that she had used money from her charities to try and keep his business going. Although totally unfounded, it would do damage to both her and her charity's reputation for a number of years. Their financial problems would be solved, however, when Elizabeth's brother took over her husband's business and paid off his debtors. In the field of medical care, she would also investigate and offer reform ideas to many mental asylums around the country. And in 1840, she opened a training school for nurses in Guy's Hospital in London. Her work would go on to inspire Florence Nightingale, who took a team of Fry nurses with her when she went to the Crimean War. Fry's influence and renown was widespread, gaining her admirers from all over the social spectrum. Among her most notable was Queen Victoria, who even donated money to many of the causes championed by Elizabeth and the two women met on several occasions, with Victoria describing Fry as a very superior person, with some claiming that Victoria, who was almost 40 years younger than Elizabeth, tried her best to model herself after her. There was also Robert Peel, who would go on to be Prime Minister, who helped pass several of her acts and further her mission and causes. And the strangest that seems to stand out is Frederick William IV of Prussia, who met with her several times, including one visit to Britain, when he expressed desire to see her again, only to be told she was busy working in Newgate Prison. He insisted that he and his courtiers would simply go and meet her within the prison as well, which I'm sure must have been an unusual experience for all involved. Elizabeth Fry died on the 12th of October, 1845, aged 65, in Ramsgate, after suffering from a stroke. She was buried in the Friends Burial Ground in Barking, East London. Traditionally, Quakers do not have funeral services. This did not stop over a thousand people turning up on the day she was buried to pay her respects, as well as tributes paid to her from all over the country, including many sailors who, on finding out about her death and on the day of her funeral, flew their flags at half-mast, something that is normally reserved for royalty. Her life and her achievements would see her as one of the chief proponents of prison reform in Europe. After her death, the Lord Mayor of London convened a meeting to decide on something to honour her life and memory. What was chosen was the Elizabeth Fry Refuge, an institute for ex-prisoners while they were getting back on their feet. It would run until 1925, when it became a charitable organisation and changed to a hostel for women on probation. It was moved to Reading in 1962, where it remains to this day. What Elizabeth Fry was able to achieve in her life cannot be understated. Not only did she turn the lives of countless women around, 
with even the wildest prisoners being said to have turned orderly, disciplined, and in some cases even devout under her supervision. Her actions would also make her a figurehead of the early feminist movement, with her drive and attitude showing many that women had a place outside of domestic duties. As you would expect from someone who has done such deeds, Elizabeth's life has long been remembered. Helped by her daughters, who edited the 44 volumes of her diaries for the public to see, and now several memorials stand to her across the country. Plaques can be found on the building she lived in, from her place of birth in Norwich to houses in London. Her name is also on the Reformers Monument in Kensal Green Cemetery in London. There is a terracotta bust to her in the gatehouse of Wormwood Scrubs, and a statue of her in the Old Bailey. The most famous tribute to her came in the early 2000s from the Bank of England, with her being placed on the £5 note from 2001 until 2016, when she was replaced with Winston Churchill. There are a number of hospital buildings, wards, and even several roads around the country that bear her name. The closest tribute to me personally is Old Buckingham High School, that named the new schoolhouse they had created in 2006 after her. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. All the information and pictures used can be found in the description below. Please feel free to like and subscribe if you wish. This was Elizabeth Fry, the prison reformer, and this was A Little Bit of History.